I'm pressing the live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Our guest today is Charlie Gattunio. Charlie, you ready to be great today? Yeah. Charlie graduated from Adelphi University in 1983 and, and then made the big move to London, where he spent a year in London working as an actor. He then moved back to N NYC in 1984, spent the next five years working as an actor, director, and writer. Later on, he took a job at Microsoft as a video teleconferencing engineer and spent the next 20 years at Microsoft working in several capacities to include engineer, product manager, and team manager. He's been working on and off as a professor of photographer since 1978. His first gig was photo photographing, photographing the band Queen at the Boston Garden for a small local music magazine. In 2008, he created a project called Stories of Autism, which over the next 10 years documented the lives of families with, lives of families with members on the autism spectrum. In 2014, he was part of the mass layoff of Microsoft and decided to go full-time in the photo photography business. Charlie, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So, Charlie, uh, softball question first. Sure. What do you do for fun? Um, I like to bicycle. Um, and I like to play music. I made my living as a bass player. Well, part of my living as a bass player in the 80s and um, up through the mid 90s, uh, playing all sorts of clubs and with different bands and touring. And so um, I like to just kind of sit back and play the bass for a while every once in a while. So the bicycle is like, how serious are you? Like, are you on the field like, like ride 20 miles every weekend or you just do it once in a blue moon? Yeah, so it got to a point um, a few years ago when I was doing between 150 and 250 miles per week. Um, it's just something I started to do when I was about 11 years old, really loved it. Um, I would, I grew up outside of Boston, and uh, I would just take off after school and uh, maybe ride all the way into Harvard Square in, uh, in rush hour traffic and back. So that was about a 30 mile round trip. And it's just something I've always loved to do. And so I continue that. I'm not doing 150, 250 miles anymore. Um, although I think I will, I, I may try to start that regimen again really soon. But, you know, just getting on the bike, it's relieves stress, clears my mind. And I like to stay in shape. So I have to like relax your mind and like get you focus, all kind of stuff. And just like, so that's, so that's, like, that's like your meditation, so to speak. Yeah, it is. It It is quite a lot like a meditation you know i'm i've got the computer on my bike so i'm keeping track of my speed um you know how my my cadence you know basically how many rpms with with, with my feet on the pedals um and i'm i'm fairly competitive with myself and so i'm always trying to do a better job than i did the last time i was out so you're like one of those me versus me people. Yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of something I've been cursed with uh, my yeah, entire I'm, I'm, life. I'm the same way, yeah. Yep. Exactly. And then um, what, was, what was your degree at, at Alpha University? My, my degree was in acting. Okay. Um, yeah, so it was uh, kind of a tough school to get into at the time. Is that known as like an actor school, like Juilliard is known for arts and stuff? or It's not necessarily known for that, but... Um, at the time, it was one of the best programs in the country. So you had to audition to get in. And I remember in my freshman year, um, 50 people uh, were admitted. And by the time I graduated, the class had whittled down to about 18. Is that, definitely, is that actually in New York City or someplace else? It's right outside of New York City. Okay. It's in Garden City, okay. which is probably about five to 10 minutes from the actual border of Queens in it, New York is City. Is it like a private school, public school? Yeah, it, it's it's a private school. Okay. But um there's been a lot of um, a lot of good actors have come from that, and a lot of a lot of people have done well, you know, in that business. Um, one of my friends was a guy named Jonathan Larson. He's the guy who wrote Rent, and um, you know, huge musical, won all sorts of prizes. Um, and John was a really good friend of mine. We would do a lot of writing while we were at school, and even after we graduated from college, we um, had several bands together and did a lot of writing together, and. It's funny, his roommate was a guy named Todd Robinson, and Todd has gone on to direct many Hollywood films. I think he might have even been um, nominated for an Oscar for a, um, uh, for a documentary he did. But, you know, other people that I went to school with or that I knew, I mean, they're pretty big in the um, voiceover business. I'll hear them on commercials or 
television, you know, program promos and things like that. So a lot of good people came out of that school. So I have to ask, you were from Boston, New York City. Yeah. Boston, New York City, they have Robert, all kind of sports, all kind of whatever thing. Yeah. How did that work for you to go from like Boston, New York, like this Boston fuckers here, what are you doing down here? How, yeah, how yeah. You? So, you know, it, it was really interesting. It was really great. Um, I used to go to Yankee Stadium for uh, Red Sox uh, Yankees games. And I remember, I remember this one game in particular, I think it was in 1986. Um, Roger Clemens was pitching for the Red Sox. And after four, after the top of the fourth, the Red Sox were ahead. I think it was like 11 to nothing. Oh no, I think it might've been nine to nothing. And it was kind of raining that day that evening. And so all the Yankees fans, you know, were yelling for a rain out, you know, when it's a rain out before the fifth inning, then, or before the completion of the fifth inning, the game doesn't count. And so anyway, um, in the bottom of the fourth inning, the Yankees came back and scored 11 runs. And then the, at that point, all the Red Sox fans were yelling for a rain out. And then the top of the fifth, the Red Sox tied it. And there was no scoring again until the 12th inning when the Yankees eventually won. But, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. And um, you know, another time was the 86 World Series when the Red Sox were playing the Mets. And um, I remember being in my apartment and, you know, being a lifelong Red Sox fan. I know that, uh, you know, it's truly not over till it's that over. That'd be a painful time for oh, you. Oh, man. So, I, yeah. So I had some friends over in my apartment uh, in Manhattan. And I remember there were two outs, two strikes on the last batter. And I had a bottle of champagne and you know, my, these two gals who were over was saying, just pop it already. They're going to win. And like, nope, got to wait till the last out. And, and sure enough, they, they blew it. The ball went through Bill Buckner's legs and game seven. It, I mean, even though the Red Sox were ahead, I remember I had a band practice that night and it's like, I didn't even care, you know, and the Red Sox ended up losing. So there's, there was always some really good badgering you know, between friends of mine who were from New York, between Red Sox and Yankees and Celtics, Knicks. So it was a lot of fun. You ever go see any of the Sox games where they play here in Seattle? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have. I've, I've seen quite a few. So pretty much every time they come to Seattle, I will I will go to one of their games. Nice. So what made you decide to move to London? Um, it, it was actually kind of funny. Um, I remember at the beginning of uh, my junior year of college, um, a bunch of my friends said, hey, you know, um, we want to go to London at the end of the year. We want to move and, um, you know, just spend the summer there before our senior year. And I said, great, I'd love to do it. And as it turned out, I was the only one who followed through, saved the money and, and actually went. And so um, my first uh, summer in London, um, I got there during a transportation strike. So there was, <laughs> it was really difficult getting around. And um yeah, I ended up getting a job in a hotel. And the great thing about Europe is that a lot of times, if you get a job at a hotel, they will actually let you live there. They'll have a floor set aside. Of course, they take a little bit more out of your paycheck. But um, I ended up living um, in a hotel for a couple months and um, getting around London. And I was going to Paris and I spent two weeks in Spain. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was great. And then once I got back, I decided that after my senior year, I wanted to go back. And so I went back. Um, I think it was maybe two days after I go after my uh, college graduation. And I ended up spending more time there. And I got I worked in a pub um, for a long time. But I also worked as an actor, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, Peter, like so I was in Europe, like a total of seven years, two years, like by myself and I was single four and a half years of family. Mm -hmm. like people in the states realize how great it is in europe like the train go anywhere like you, you be like in germany let's go to amsterdam it's a three-hour drive yeah you just Train's go even better it's like and and they're like you know back in your uh, younger days like the club don't close at two in the morning right the club like pretty much stay open until the, someone leaves right right before it leaves mm -hmm. right the last person's gone yeah you got the october fest there's always a fest going on like mm -hmm. you have no idea what a great life is over there yeah like, it, it's it's a lot of fun and i i really enjoyed it and I only left because I couldn't get my work visa renewed again. So that, that was the only reason why I left. Otherwise, you know, I might still be living there. I just loved it so much. So what was like the pro and you only lived in London? Yeah, I lived in London, but I, you know, I traveled all around England and Scotland and France and Spain. 
Can you talk about how the London English is different from our English? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> the first thing I learned was that you don't ask for a napkin in a restaurant uh, because uh, a napkin in England is a sanitary napkin. Oh. And so <laughs> when you ask a waitress or somebody for a napkin, you, you kind of get this look of horror. Um, and then you quickly learn that what you what you need to ask for is a serviette. Uh, not, not a napkin. So that, that was kind of like my first real introduction to the difference in language. Um, but, you know, other than that, I mean, other than some terms, um, like, you know, for a car, the hood is a bonnet, the trunk is, uh, uh, I forget what they call the trunk. But anyway, um, you know, other than some general terms, it, it's really about the same. It, it's no different say then you know when you have the vernacular of the northeast and then you go to the southwest or something like that different little differences there but generally speaking there there really aren't any language problems yeah i remember i say it's in germany right and one time after the club went to mcdonald's right and like they give us the big mac whatever and like hey can we get some ketchup yeah and they said to me like this turn tur like are you kidding me right we almost, we almost had a fight with them in the McDonald's, like because yeah. they don't want to. We like, use the free ketchup package, free napkins. They would charge us first, like right. Like and we're like, we only charge because we're you know American military paper, right? Mm -hmm. But no, it's charged everyone, right? So things like that you're used to. Yeah, so so there were things like that. Um, you know, also if I think about McDonald's, they would put mustard on their burgers, which nobody does here. Actually, maybe in the Northeast where I grew up in Boston, they they may have put mustard on burgers, but there were things like that. And at that time, you know, if you went to the grocery store, you had to pay for a bag. So, I mean, now here in the States, you know, there's more of an effort to get people, you know, to, to pay for a bag or anything. But back then, that was really kind of hard to get used to. And, um, you know, also the grocery stores, um, they didn't have half of what we have okay. here in America. It's not that they didn't maybe have the products, but they didn't have the same variety of products. So, you know, you might want to buy breakfast cereal and there might be like you know a quarter of an aisle dedicated to it where you know here you go to Safeway and it's the entire aisle you know of, of different cereals so you know you had to get used to that aspect of it but generally speaking you know what they have in Europe is basically the same as we have here yeah I remember me and my family came back from being in Germany Italy for like four and a half years and it was too much we came here it was too much all, all the options like I like man this is too much it's, yeah I can't I can't deal with this it's yeah. overwhelming yeah, if you're used to it, I can see where coming back is, is too much. And, you know, I even remember the times I came back and, um, you know, it, it's almost like decadence. You know, you can't believe all the options you actually have, you know, and, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, that depends on the person. But, you know, um, at least at that point here in the States, um, you know, we, we have a lot, many more options for what we want. So what made you decide to get a degree in acting? Were you always interested in acting as a little kid? How did that come about? Yeah, so um, kind of like moving to London, it you know it started with somebody else's idea, and um, I went through with it, and they didn't. So I I, <laughs> I remember I was in eighth grade, and I always I always ran track. I was big into running track and field, and. Um, this gal who was in ninth grade had a crush on me and told me that, you know, I should audition for the school play. And I remember asking my parents, you know, hey, you know, I, do you mind if I audition for the school play? And at first they said, no, you're doing too much. And then, you know, I told them, I I'm not going to get in. It's because this girl has a crush on me. And they're like, all right, go ahead and audition for it. And so I auditioned for it and I got in and she didn't. Um, and so I remember I had the smallest part in the play. I think I had like two lines uh, and I was only on once, maybe on stage for about 30 seconds, but I just liked it. And um, the next year I got the lead in whatever the play was that we were doing. I think it was, might've been like meet me in St. Louis. And, and or what, something. Grade, what grade was this again? That was, so I was in eighth grade. I started and then in ninth grade, I got it. And then when I got to high school, I actually became part of a touring magic company which was really interesting. Um, and I was doing the school plays and things like that. And then, you know, we would, we would go into competitions, you know, um, district competitions with short plays and we always did well. And I just kind of followed it up. And um, I had a couple friends that ended up going to Adelphi university. Um, and, you know, they encouraged me to audition, which I did. 
So that's kind of how I got into it, totally by accident, which is like 90% of my life. So were you like a serious actor, a method actor, comedic actor? Or like, um, Probably my my uh, forte was in comedic acting, but I, I also did serious roles as well. Um, method, you know, when you think of method, you think of Daniel Day-Lewis, who maybe, you know, stays in character even you know, when they're not shooting, I, I wasn't like that, you know, I was able to, um, I was able to turn it on and turn it off. And if I was, if I did study one, um, one method of acting, it was called the Stanislavski method. And he was a, he was a Russian actor and director. And his thing was that you wear yourself out to the point where you have no barriers. Um, so you have nothing blocking yourself and the character. And a lot of that was physical work. So before I go on stage, I do a lot of running, um, you know, wind sprints, which I remembered from playing football in, in junior high school. You know, you really try to um, exhaust yourself to a point where you no longer have any mental barrier. You don't have anything in the way of you relating to the character and delivering your lines. So I, I was really kind of into that method. And not a lot of people were. And a lot of people thought I was crazy for doing it. You know, a lot of times people would try to save their energy before they got on stage, but I would try to expend just enough where there was nothing in the way of the words I had to say and the character that I had to portray. Who else like some actors now or, or any, any time, you know, a lot of times you think are like really good actors, like, like top notch actors. Ah, uh, geez. Um, you know, I, I mean, the people who we consider great actors um, might be people like Tom Hanks, um, who can do a variety of different things. Um, there's, you know, Jack Nicholson, um, Dustin Hoffman, um, Al Pacino. You know, when you look at the variety of roles that they've done, they've been, they're just amazing. Um, Danny Glover is a really good actor. I remember um, there was a Broadway play that I saw I think it might have been either in previews or right before it opened. There was a there was a play called Master Harold and the Boys, three character play. Um, it was um, Danny Glover, an actor named Zakes Mackay, South African actor, and Matthew Broderick, and it was all about um, this boy who was played by a white boy who was played by Matthew Broderick growing up in South Africa under apartheid and um Danny Glover and Zakes Mackay were kind of they were they were kind of the the servants in the home and obviously not equal to everybody else in the home and it was a whole play about the transformation of their relationship with um Matthew Broderick you know kind of you know they were they were kind of his caretakers and then there's a conflict and he basically pulls the race card on them well you know i'm white i'm privileged i you know my name's harold and i live in this house and you work for me so thus master harold and the boys and i just remember the acting from all three of those actors just being so amazing just completely blew me away um obviously you know danny glover and matthew broderick have a whole lot of fame zakes mckay um, was primarily a stage actor but just an amazing talent um, and so, you know, when I think back on some just amazing performances that I've seen, it's definitely those three actors in that play. So you're, you're, you're in London. Did you find it easier or harder to find acting jobs as an American? Harder, harder. definitely harder. Um, but the, the one role I did get was a small role in a play where I played an American soldier. Um, and uh, I, I got a great review in the paper for my American accent. <laughs> so so that was great so and then you were also work in the public too right yeah yeah that that was also an experience can you tell us like one crazy question that you, one, one crazy story that you tell us about the pub yeah when i first worked there i mean i'm i was used to going to american bars and and you pour a beer and you you know you might leave a quarter an inch along the top but every but everything there is measured you know a half pint is a certain amount um, and of course, people want a little more in there. And a pint is a certain amount. And when you fill a pint, 
I didn't realize it at the time, but you fill it to the brim and there is zero foam. And so um, I worked in what was known as a public house. And public houses are kind of, you know, they're more in, they're more the original type of pubs that were in London. Um, you know, very few, very little hard alcohol. The beer comes out of a pump. It's typically room temperature, the way it used to be. And I remember um, one of my first days, I, the pub I worked in was around Fleet Street, which was the newspaper district. And so um, the, the, the truck drivers who dropped off the newspapers, um, they would finish their morning run. They would show up at 11 o'clock, drink five pints generally, and then go out and do the afternoon run. Okay, so 11 in the morning, five Til beer two. mugs. Till two. At that point, pubs were open like from 11 to three and then again from like five to 11 at night. Um, and it all stems back to World War II. And they and they no longer operate that way. But these um, newspaper truck drivers would come in. And uh, so, you know, I always knew if I saw a newspaper truck you know, uh, after, you know, after 3 p.m. and I was walking around, you know, I try to avoid <laughs> them at any cost. But anyway, um, I remember one time I poured a pint for this old codger and maybe there was an eighth of an inch and he actually threw the whole pint at me, glass and all. And he said, I ordered an effing pint. I want an effing pint. Pour me another pint. So I, I, I learned really quickly that, you know, if I didn't want to get any more beer or glasses thrown at me, that I had to fill it up to the top with no foam. Yes. And so you said you moved back to the States because of your visa problem, right? Yeah. So if you had had the visa, would you, how much longer do you think you would have stayed in London? Uh, at least a couple more years. Couple more years. Yeah. Having, having a lot of fun over there. Yeah, I had, I had a lot of fun, lived in a great flat in a great part of town. Um, yeah, I, I definitely would have stayed longer. And what are, the, what are the places in Europe did you travel to go visit while you were there? Uh, Scotland. So, you know, I went to Edinburgh, um, all different cities in, in England. So whether it be Bath or Brighton, Cambridge, um, I would travel to Paris. Um, didn't go too much outside of Paris, but I went to Paris several times. Spain, I would go down to the Medi Mediterranean coast. Um, I liked this little town called Fuengirola, which was right outside of Malaga. Um, so I used to go there quite a bit. There was actually a large British community there. So, you know, it was easy to go there and speak to people and communicate. So I would go there. And um, other parts of Spain, Toledo, Barcelona. Yeah, Barcelona is um, a freaking great city. Yeah, great, great place. Madrid, um, Cordoba, you know, all my, my dad was a Spanish professor and spoke Spanish without an accent. And um, I remember the summer of 72, he took the whole family there. So I was familiar with all these different parts of Spain that I, I used to like to visit. Yeah, I remember like when I was in Europe during the army times, like we go to different places visiting, like doing whatever. Mm -hmm. You always tell the British people. Yep. I like them some crazy fuckers. Like, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was like, there's no, like, there's no guessing or, or you knew, okay, that guy's a British dude. Yeah. Like there's no, yeah, there's like. Yeah. And, and I remember the summer of 82, the first time I went to London on my own, I, I, I went to um, I, I went to Spain for a couple of weeks. And the summer of 82 was when the World Cup was being played in Spain. And so, yeah, there were definitely a bunch of British hooligans there. You know, yeah. easy to tell them yeah. from anybody else. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very easy to tell. Mm -hmm. And so you moved back to New York City to, to continue your acting career? Acting and music, yeah. Okay. So why New York City versus Boston or LA? Because I guess you had roots in New York City and that's all you have to go. Yeah, that, I, I mean, even though I'm from Boston, I spent, you know, four years in New York. Um, you know, and so I got to know New York. I got to know how everything worked. That was, there was more opportunity in New York. Of course, there were more people trying, you know, to get that opportunity. But, you know, it was just kind of the place to go. And, and so that's where I decided that I wanted to, kind of set my roots for the time being and, uh, you know, work as a performer, whether it's an actor, director, writer, or musician. And it's the next five years where you're like, kind of like a struggling actor, like getting by, like getting small roles, like doing part -time Yeah, get, like getting stage roles, small stage roles. And at one point I, I got really frustrated with acting because, um, you know, you can give a great audition, but for some reason, there's something about you that may not be quite right for a role. Uh, so, so you wouldn't get it. Whereas I found in music, um, 
it was a lot easier to find a place to play and a place to perform. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, there's something about your personality that isn't right for one of these roles. Um, you know, I could just go out, put a band together and, uh, you know, play any number of places. And so to me, that was actually a little bit more appealing. So, you know, while I was still acting, I wasn't acting as much as, as I was doing music. So you're just more to the music side of your career, so to speak. Yeah. And you say you play the you play, play the bass guitar. Yeah, bass. So when did you start with that, and why the bass guitar versus all the other instruments? So I, I didn't start playing bass until um, my senior year of high school, and the reason why I, I I decided to go with bass guitar was I had a lot of friends who played regular guitar and an acoustic guitar, and what we used to do is you know every four or five months we used to write a bunch of music get a bunch of beer and just make our own albums of music we had written. And it was all acoustic and vocal, um, no drums or anything, but you know, I, I just thought that to me, uh, I thought you were going to say no drugs. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at that point it wasn't the drugs. It was more the alcohol, but anyway, um, I just thought, you know, we could use a bass player and it would be interesting to learn how to play the bass. And so I, at the end of my junior year, I bought a really cheap bass guitar and took lessons for a couple months, but ended up teaching myself. And so um, that's how I decided to get into playing bass. So random question, like I tell you in the pre-talk, I've been like listening to a lot of Les Zeppelin, right? Yeah. And I watched this one documentary on them and I, and I rated like guitarists, right? One, two, and three. So I want you to give me your top three guitarists of all time. I see what Max with this, what, what this person said. My top three guitarists of all time. I think Jimi Hendrix, absolutely, you know, number one. What he did and the way he transformed how to use the guitar was amazing. Um, Eddie Van Halen, amazing guitarist. Now, we're talking rock guitarists, not necessarily jazz guitarists, but, you know, Eddie Van Halen, the way he kind of moved the art forward. And then after that, you know, I'd say you've got people like Jimmy Page, uh, with Led Zeppelin, Brian May of Queen, um, just so many others that that are really great. But you know, when when I think about people who really moved the art of guitar playing forward, you know, you've got to look at Jimi Hendrix number one and Eddie Van Halen number two. Yeah, this list had Jimmy Page three, Jimi Hendrix two, and Eric Clapton number one. Yeah, yeah, Eric Clapton. But again. me, I don't see anyone to have Jimi Hendrix number one. Yeah, like, and I, I don't, so when I saw Jimi Hendrix and we talked, like, yeah, this this list is fucking shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and Eric Clapton definitely, you know, had a lot of in, you know had a lot of influence, but um, you know, again, when I when I think of who really took it and pushed the boundaries, you know, Jimi Hendrix and then Eddie Van Halen was kind of like the next generation. And the stuff Jimmy Page did, like he would like do the violin bow on the guitar strings and yep. all the different things he would do, like yeah, so experimental, like this person the envelope yeah i mean there there are so many great guitarists and you know any list to me you know one is Jimi hendrix two is eddie van halen and everything else you know yeah. there's a great argument for probably hundreds of different people so even eddie, eddie van halen is like kind of you know old school right are they like new guitarists that you would like have a potential you have a chance to break in the top three uh you know, I anybody who anybody else who I think is a really fantastic guitarist does, really doesn't have a huge name in the business. Okay. You know, um, I think of Reeves Gabrels. Um, so he's a guitarist from Boston. He worked with David Bowie for a long time with Tin Machine. Um, and uh, then he toured with Bowie and he's been playing with The Cure, I think, since 2012. Just an amazing guitarist. Um, you know, when I look at jazz guitarists, there's Al Demiola, um, who, who comes to mind. He's just a mind blowing guitarist. He, he's so good. Um, but, you know, I, I guess maybe it might be because, you know, I don't I don't explore pop music so much, you know, in the 2000s, mainly because, you know, I find it to be uh, very manufactured. Yeah. Um, not that there aren't talented people doing it, but, you know, to me now, popular music is more about the beat, 
um, more about, you know, how memorable is it? The packaging. How the... packaged it is. You don't see people taking as many chances as yeah. you used to. Or if there are people taking chances, really trying to push whatever it is they do in music forward, um, it, it's not really coming to the forefront. And you really have to search for those people. And there's definitely not any more trauma, trauma in a song like Les Zeppelin used to do back in the day. Right. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's completely changed. You know, what was what could be popular in the 70s um, and even into part of the 80s could never be popular now. It just won't sell. So the band in New York City, what kind of music do you play? Is that a rock and roll band? or I, I played mostly um, what would be known, I, I guess, alternative, uh, post-punk and alternative. Um, so, I mean, the bands I was in, we would play clubs like CBGB, Maxis, Kansas City, The Limelight, um, clubs that were known for maybe not necessarily pop music, but a little bit more progressive. Uh, and, and actually progressive may be categorizing it wrong, maybe um, alternative. So clubs that, you know, you might have find bands like the Ramones, the Talking Heads. Um, those are the types of clubs I was playing. And you say you, you, it was way easier to find, to find musical gigs with acting gigs, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean... Um, a, a club or a small bar would be more likely to book any type of music act that had a following um, than say like a small theater. Um, there were experimental theaters, um, you know, all over New York, but even still, you know, trying to get into those, it, it was a little bit more difficult. And I, I just really wanted to perform. I wanted to be on stage and um, I had two different things I could do and it was easier to do with the music than it was with the acting. And you say you're doing studio work too, but studio work is like you just like get paid to fill a party in for for different bands or whatever right. is studio work. Right. Yeah. And so um, I did work for people who were putting together musicals. So they were putting um, demos together, you know, for a musical they were writing, or you know, somebody needed a bass player on a, uh, you know, on a on a demo tape that they were putting together for a record company or something like that. Um, the the one thing I learned, and, and it's funny, you know, my son is uh, an up and coming jazz saxophonist and doing really well. And one of the pieces of advice I gave to him was music is all about time, not only playing on time, but showing up on time, because there are so many musicians um, and actors who, you know, think that they can show up, you know, whatever time they want, they can be an hour late, they can be two hours late. Um, but, you know, what I learned was, you know, people people will take a, a little bit of a step down if they know they can rely on you. And I was a good bass player. I wouldn't consider myself a great bass player. But, I, you know, I was good enough that, you know, if I showed up on time and people could rely on me, then I would get the job. And I got a lot of jobs because people knew, okay, he can play the music and he's going to be there on time. We're not going to be sitting there wasting money on engineers and studio time because someone didn't show up. Nice. That's an interesting story. So I, I saw this on the internet a little while ago. As a singer named Akon, he's like an R&B singer. He did a song back in the day with Eminem, right? And Akon said, no, he got there at 6 p.m., right? You know, doing the, like I said, so many wants to write. Mm -hmm. Like with Eminem, right? Eminem left at 5. What do you mean at 5? Yeah, he works 9 to 5. What do you mean works 9 to 5? We're missing just, no, Eminem works at nine to five. He yep. took like a job. Yeah. So Akon came back the next day, like nine or five. You know, they did music or whatever, like five o'clock. Okay, I'll catch you later. What do you mean? Where are you going? I'm going to lunch. Yeah. I eat lunch from twelve to one. What? What are you doing? Right. Yeah. And then he came back one and like worked at one to five. Like, I'm leaving for the DC tomorrow. Akon like, yeah, I'm like, we're, we're right there, right? With a few more hours, we have the song done. Right. Okay. Akon, what can happen the next few hours that can't wait? Mm -hmm. Like, I have kids, I have family, you know. I treat this as a job. I suggest yep. you do too. And it kind of like he changed the whole mentality after that, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and everybody has a different way of working, you know? Uh, I mean, I've heard of a number of people like that. And then, you know, so many bands, you know, they don't want to start working until 7 PM and then, or maybe even 11 PM and they'll go until six in the morning, you know? So every, everybody has their preferred way of working regardless, you know, if you are doing a job for somebody, it is your job to understand when they want you there and to be there and to be prepared. So you also did some audio engineering work. Yeah. What exactly is that? I think I know what it is, but I just want to make sure I know what it is. Yeah. So it's essentially going into the studio, um, understanding microphone placement, how to work a soundboard, and um, basically engineering and recording a musical 
musical act. So kind of like a, I'm going to say like a um, baby producer or junior producer, something like that. Yeah. I, I mean, producer is, is a little bit different, but a lot of times when you're an engineer and working, you know, if you're working with people who are just coming up, you end up being their producer or, you know, a band might think that because you're an engineer, you're a producer, but as an engineer, strictly your job is to get the sound a band or producer wants reproduced and, and recorded. And back when I did it, it was on two inch tape. You know, now it's it's all digital and um, I, I wouldn't know the first place to start with that. Nice. And so you spent those five years in New York, New York City, then you decided to move to LA. Yeah. Why the jump to LA? Oh man. Um, I had a lot of friends who were actors who had moved to LA and I, I had always considered, you know, well, you know, before I get too old, why not try to live in LA? And the impetus to do it was actually a, a pretty unfortunate event. Um, so St. Patrick's Day in 1989. So if, if you've lived in New York for any amount of time, you know that the three craziest days in New York or the three craziest times are Halloween night, New Year's Eve, and the night of St. Patrick's Day. Um, those aren't necessarily um, celebrations that are for a specific community. You know, I mean, you, you have the Puerto Rican Day Parade, but, you know, that's mostly the Puerto Rican community that celebrates it. But, you know, with those three things, everybody celebrates those days. And so it's really crazy. And so um, on the evening of St. Patrick's Day in 1989, I remember I had done um, some engineering throughout the throughout the entire day. And I kept a I kept a job as a waiter at a small restaurant for three nights a week. Um, I always had that, you know, in case the music or the acting went down, I at least had something to make some money. And so on that day, it was a Friday, and I worked all day at a studio recording a few bands, and then I had my wait, my waiting job. And then um, after that, myself and this other guy who worked there, we went out for a beer afterwards. And I lived about maybe a 20-minute walk from where I worked and from where I was. And I, I would typically walk home. Um, and so I remember walking with this friend of mine and he was, I, I lived right by Astor Place and he would usually take that subway home. Um, so, you know, I wasn't walking home alone. And so this one night we got to Sixth Avenue and there was a hot dog stand, King's Hot Dogs, I think it was. And so we got a hot dog and he said, you know, tonight I'm going to take the F train home. So I'm just going to walk down Sixth Avenue and you know, get the, get the F train. And I thought, fine. So I'm walking by myself and I lived in a really nice part of town right off, you know, eighth street. Um, and so I'm walking down eighth street and there's a group of people walking towards me. And normally I would always cross the street. Um, but this night I'd worked all day, all night. I was really exhausted. And I just thought I'm not going to cross the street. It's probably people coming out of a movie theater that was right there. And so as they drew closer, I could see it was a, a gang of skinheads. And so they were taking up most of the sidewalk. And so as they approached, I kind of moved to the inside part of the sidewalk and let them go by. And I started walking and then I got hit on the back of the head pretty hard. And I turned around and it was this one guy and everybody else, probably about 10 of them, they started pulling out sawed off baseball bats from their jackets. And then they had what I later learned the hard way were socks with pool balls in them. And so uh, this one guy said, give me a wallet. And I just, I just knew I was in for it. And I said, what the fuck did you have to do that for? And he came at me and I just punched him in the nose. I, I may have broken his nose, blood came out and I just hit the ground basically in the fetal position. And um, for what seemed like 10 minutes, but I'm sure it was less than a minute, um, I was just beaten by, by their sawed off baseball bats and their, um, and their pool balls in socks. And so they kept yelling at me, you know, give me a wallet, give me a wallet. And finally I said, well, you know, get off me and you can have my wallet. And so they kind of pulled back and I reached into my pocket and I just threw my wallet and I had a new leather jacket on. 
And then someone said, get his jacket. And so the whole thing started all over again. And um, they managed to get the jacket off me. And then the cab pulled up. And it was, uh, I think, the driver and two gals. They get out. And um, the all the skinheads ran away. And then cops pulled up in a van. And um, they were almost as bad as the skinheads. They basically said... They basically picked me up, threw me in the van, and then said, let's find the N-words that did this. And I'm like, no, it was a bunch of skinheads. And I was, my head was spinning. I, I you know, I could, I, I was barely conscious. And they drove around the village looking for who they thought might have beat me up and never found them. And then just basically let me off on a corner further away from home than where I live. Um, not even offering to take me to the hospital or anything. So I got home or I got back to my apartment. I had to call my roommate because my keys were in my jacket that they took. And um, it, it was it was a really traumatic experience. Um, and so I thought to myself, you know what? Now might be a good time to finish up what I'm doing and move to LA. So I, I took six months, saved my money, finished up a whole bunch of recording projects and then moved to LA. And how many times had you been in that neighborhood walking around? A lot. Oh, of it, was, it was where I lived. So, I mean, every had, day. Have you ever seen these people before? No, I had never seen these people before. But it was where I lived. I walked down that street every single day. It was considered a safe area. But, you know, when you, when, you know, it's basically a citywide mob, mob mentality. And what year was this? This was 89. Oh, yeah, those are the bad years in New York City, right? Yeah, New York City in the 70s and 80s wasn't necessarily the best. It, the 70s were really bad, which is when I moved there in 79. And then it started to get better in the 80s and, you know, progressed through the 90s to where, you know, now Times Square is like Disneyland, uh, which wasn't the case back then. But, you know, it was it was on the upswing, but it still, you know, wasn't necessarily the safest place to live. So how much physical harm did it do to you? Um I probably had a couple cracked ribs and a concussion. I had bruises on my head, bruises on my torso. Um, you know, I didn't end up going to the hospital, but I, I would say it probably took a took a few weeks for me to, you know, feel decent. So I'm guessing after the way the police did, you didn't go follow a police report or nothing like that. Or no, I, at that point, I felt what was the point? You know, I, I had already been treated like shit by the people who picked me up and threw me in a van, you know. Like no medical help, no first aid, no nothing, nothing. And so, I mean, I knew that I didn't have any displaced bones. I've had broken bones before. And if it was something that was cracked, there was nothing they were going to do for me except say, hey, be careful, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, you know, why put out the money for an emergency room visit and x-rays when, you know, it would eventually heal. And were you still able to like go to work and like do your student yeah. work and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't easy, but you know, I don't I don't think I missed any work or any gigs. You know, I, I think, you know, within those couple of weeks, I definitely played live and you know, um I would move around a lot when I played, but you know, for a few weeks, you no, know, I was just kind of standing there and making sure I could hit every note. So all your all, like all your friends and family in New York City, tell, how many did you tell anyone just something you kept to yourself? Um, you know, I I I told a number of people, um, you know, my family was in Boston, you know, and I, I told my parents and they were obviously very concerned and my friends were concerned, but, you know, um, there was definitely some PTSD involved. I was, I was walking around, you know, with a utility knife in my pocket, ready to, you know, ready to slip out the blade if anybody, you know, came near me. And the funny part, well, maybe funny, maybe sad, but I decided at that point that if I was ever leaving any place after 10 p.m., I would take a cab. And so I kept that up for a couple of weeks uh, until um, the cab I was in actually got robbed at gunpoint. <laughs> Nothing happened to me. But at that point, I'm like, you know, what difference does it make? You know, I, I might as well just walk because, you know, being in a cab necessarily wasn't any safer. So New York City is like the, like the wild, wild west back then, right? It's just like crime everywhere. It's yeah, you know, it, it it went through that point in the mid 70s where they had to declare bankruptcy and President Ford wouldn't bail them out. So um, it, it was, is just at the same time, like when the Bronx was like on fire every night or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't want to go to the Bronx. Um, yeah, there were, there were definitely parts of it that weren't good. Like I said, I mean, it was a step up from where it was in the mid 70s, but, 
you know, it, it was still coming out of that, you know, really bad period of, you know, bankruptcy. And, um, you know, I, I, I remember seeing on the news, you know, gang, you know, mob murders that would took place like maybe five blocks from where I lived. And I lived in a great part of town, you know, right in Greenwich village. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting time to live in New York city. So you took that as a sign to get the hell out of Dodge, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of always wanted to, um, to live in LA and I had friends there and I figured, well, you know what, maybe this is a sign. And so, um, I moved to, uh, LA in October of 94. I'm sorry. October of 89 is when I moved. So you hear a lot of time people say, you know, New York's a better city. LA is a better city. You know, people to go from New York to LA, you know, I hate LA cause you know, it's so fake, whatever. Right. And of course people from LA like, Oh, the weather, New York city, how do you live in this? Why do you walk everywhere? This is ridiculous. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. So what is your take on that? What's the pros and cons of living in both cities? You know, um, you know, I think about that. There was a song called, there was a band called uh, Missing Persons and they had a song called Nobody Walks in LA. I remember that band yeah. song, yeah. And, and I remember when I moved to LA, that was the first thing that would come to mind. Nobody walks in LA. Um, and, and part of it is just the geography. I mean, it's so spread out, you know. Um, so, I mean, that was a difference, you know, between, you know, uh, walking and taking subways and buses in New York. At that point, there were no subways in LA. They were just starting to build their um, their train transit. And the bus, you know, the buses weren't as, the system wasn't as robust as it is in New York or Chicago or any, you know, major metropolitan city. So that was, that was one thing. Um, what I, one of the things I loved about LA over New York was the weather, obviously. You know, in the winter, it would snow in New York and it might look beautiful for an hour. But, you know, yeah, um, all the sludge and the oh, my snow. God, you know, you would carry an umbrella and you had to use it like a defense weapon. You know, if a car or a cab went by and they hit a pothole and, you know, you could get splashed with all that, you know, and then um, they didn't necessarily plow the sidewalks very well. So you're, you're kind of walking on this, you know, uneven ice during the during the winter, which, you know, um, actually activates a completely different different set of muscles in your legs so you would become sore and then you know they may not clear you know where you where you need to cross the street so they'd be like these little mountains that you'd have to climb over you know with a path through them and then the summers in new york um you'd have some great days but then again you know you might have 90 degrees and 80 percent humidity you know and um that's bad enough and then you go down the subways and it's 20 degrees hotter you know, so that I didn't miss. To me, the, the weather in LA was is a lot. New York nicer. City, like Seattle, like most people, Seattle have air conditioning. The most city, we both live in New York City, not have air conditioning. Um, yeah, the older buildings they will not right. have air conditioning as much as they need it. Um, I was lucky. You know, the I lived in a um, what was considered a luxury high rise, and my roommate got in uh, because it was the model apartment that they were finally putting up rent, and there was rent control. So our rent was relatively low compared to the same unit in, in the same building. You know, we had a doorman and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, L.A. was definitely different. So that much I liked. Um, the culture is, yeah, it, it's a little, it's, it's definitely more about the gloss. You know, it's more about the persona that you put on. It's more about the persona of your business than it is in New York. New York is definitely, you know, um, what you see is what you get. L.A. is a bunch of people, you know, for the most part, trying to make themselves look a lot more successful and glamorous than they actually are. Yeah. I know uh, in L.A., I have a cousin that lives in Burbank. I went visit a couple of times, right? I don't forget the person I visited who was going to go eat breakfast, right? I'm like, is this four blocks away? So walk? Look, the looks he gave me. Yeah. When I yeah. said we walk four blocks. Yeah. I'm like. Okay, I guess we're driving. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I remember it's, like, living... it's four blocks. It's like right here. Yeah. And you know, I remember in New York, the, su the supermarket might be 10 blocks away. And so, you know, you're carrying all these bags 10 blocks, you know, and in LA, um, you know, you don't even want to park on the on the far side of the parking lot. That's too far, too far to walk. Um yeah, the only and, and at that point, I, I don't know if it's much different now, but you know, as far as downtown LA goes, you didn't want to be there after dark. It was yeah. a very dangerous place. And so, you know, if you work downtown, and I had friends who did work downtown, then you know, you might do some walking, mm -hmm. but it's 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 a much smaller consolidated downtown than say like you know, Manhattan yeah. or anything like that. 
the more time I was there because in October, right? It's like we was outside and like eating breakfast somewhere. It's like 60 degrees, right? Yeah. And I you know I'm from Seattle, you know, like I so I have shorts on, you know, shirt or whatever. Mm-hmm. These jokers have like scarves on. Oh yeah. Jackets, gloves, like what in the world? It's like 60 degrees. Like, yeah. Sun's out, you know. I'm like burning up with the yeah, shorts yeah, on, right? Yeah. These yeah. jokers got scarves and stuff on. Like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, it, it, it was funny because you know it might be 55 degrees out at night and there are women with their fur coats on. You know, it was like almost any excuse to take it, you know, take it out. But, you know, I mean, you you adjust to your climate. And so that does, you know, 50 degrees up there seems like 20 degrees, you know, here in yeah. Seattle. Mm-hmm. And so what what was the reason you moved to L.A. besides the, the, the attack? Like you wanted to do for your acting career, music career? Yeah, like music. A job? Yeah, post-production. Um, and so, you know, I had been working as an audio engineer and I thought that, you know, there'd be more opportunities in post-production, a lot of post-production houses out in LA. So whether it was for, you know, commercial voiceover movies, television, um, there was, there was more opportunity for now, that. Now you already done this stuff like five years in New York city. So do you already have like kind of a reputation with your LA or you had to like start all over? No, it was essentially starting all over. And, um, my timing was horrible because at that time, um, a lot of post-production houses were moving their work out of town uh, because it was cheaper. So, you know, whether it was in Vancouver or somewhere in North Carolina, um, they they could get the work done a little, um, you know, more within their budgets. They could save money. It was less expensive. Um, and so it was probably about five months before I found found a job working in audio. And it wasn't it wasn't a typical audio job. Um, it was audio for satellite communications. So um, it was working with a lot of radio networks. It was uh, working with a lot of, um, um, I, I guess you could say, a lot of radio stations use canned music. And so those services would come into our facility and then we would pass that on via satellite. At the, when I first started, it was via satellite, and so um, it was a different side of audio. wasn't wasn't the kind of audio that I was used to, where you know you're in a studio and you're working a board and putting effects on. It was really routing audio for um, satellite communications, and so um, our clients included um, every single major league baseball team. Um, all the NHL teams, all the NFL teams, um, all the NBA teams, we were getting their signals from the venues where they were playing over to their, their radio station. So, you know, for instance, Seattle, um, the Mariners, they were on Cairo at the time. So if they were playing, say, in Texas, you know, the Texas Rangers, we, we, we took their uh, audio signal from the booth down to the D mark in the stadiums and then out over telephone lines to a satellite uplink. And then, you know, we would make sure the satellite uplink was working and they would downlink at Cairo. And then from Cairo, they would distribute to all their affiliates around the Northwest or wherever. Um, And so we were responsible for all of those links. Um, And we did the same thing for a lot of music networks. For instance, when uh, Pink Floyd uh, did the wall, um, in Berlin, you know, after the wall came down, you know, we, we took care of that, you know, getting their signal to be distributed, you know, throughout the country, um, motor racing network, um, who thought, you know, that they would be a good thing on radio, but they, it's actually huge. And I remember when I they can imagine all the sounds of like engine race and all kind of, stuff. yeah. And it, it was amazing. You know, I remember when they decided to go to a stereo feed, you know, so you could hear a car go from one speaker to the next, Um, You know, we had to break their feed. And then after a while, um, we partnered with a company out of Cleveland called Telos. And um, what they did was they had a box. And instead of using satellite, we would use ISDN lines, which were the precursor to DSL. Um, And then so what we could do was mux up to six ISDN lines together, and we would have full spectrum audio, 20, 20 hertz to 20K, which is the range of human hearing. And the advantage to that was satellite time is expensive. Um, it's not always available and it can be weather dependent. So say, you know, um, especially in the higher frequencies, if you get a lot of rain, then it could degrade the signal or, you know, 
Um, there might be someone in North Dakota and there's a lot of snow in their antenna. Well, they'd have a hard time receiving the satellite signal. So what ISDN did was it was all landline. There was no delay because with satellite, um, without getting too technical, most of the communication satellites are in a geosynchronous orbit, orbit 23,300 miles above the earth. And there's about a quarter second delay. Um, and so with ISDN, it's all over telephone lines. There was no delay. And that was especially um, advantageous for recording studios. So in our network, you know, we had Abbey Road Studio in London. And if there was somebody there who needed to lay down a track, say, I don't know, Ron Rose Studios in Detroit, um, there was no delay. And it sounded like they were in the, in the next room. And so that, that technology, satellite technology is still used, but for many different areas, the move to ISDN um, was huge. It was money saving, it was time saving, um, and there were a lot of advantages to it. So this time frame, you're like in your early 30s? Yeah. So I have to ask, well, your parents this time, like, Charlie, like, you're in your early 30s, like, are you ever going to a real job? What are you doing with your life? Or how how they how that go about? No, um, you know, my, without getting into too many details, um, growing up under um, my parents was not an easy thing. However, they were um, despite all that, they were very supportive in whatever it is, you know, that, that we wanted to do. So they were very supportive. And, you know, I, I think at that time they saw that I was kind of carving out a niche in, um, the music and audio world. Um, and so they were very supportive of it. So you, you're definitely not the traditional, you know, nine to five job person. You're like experimenting, trying to do things out, you know? Right. Yeah, I, I had a lot of different interests, and those were the things I wanted to pursue. So your time in L.A. ended in 1994, right? Yeah. And you finally decided to grow up and get married. Well, I wouldn't know if I decided to grow up, <laughs> and that's still rather debatable. But yeah, um, so after, after I went through that kind of brutal experience in New York, um, I decided I, I wanted to get away for a week. And so I visited a friend of mine in um, LA, some friends of mine's there and, and stayed with them. And um, it was opening weekend of the baseball season for the Dodgers and they had an extra ticket. So they had some friends going and um, I, um, I went and there was a gal who went with them who I met and uh, stayed in touch with and she was the she was the gal I eventually married four and a half years later. Nice. You know, like I talked about this in my last podcast, like people don't really understand like um like decision points, right? Like suppose you decided, yeah, I'm tired, I'm gonna sleep, I'm gonna go to the baseball game, right? Mm -hmm. Like all these like decision points that like do actually change your life, right? And you don't realize Yeah, I, and you know, I, I think about that all the time. I mean, if I was walking down that street and I saw those people coming and I did what I usually did, which was cross the street. I never would have been attacked. I never would have taken a week to go to LA. Never would have met my you know, wife. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that's a great point. You know. Yeah. I, it, who would have guessed you get an ass kick and live the love of your life? Exactly. <laughs> you know. And who knows? Maybe I'll get an ass kicking on my way out of here, and you know, decide to play the lottery at a certain time and hit it. I mean, yeah. I'm. You know. I mean, we we go through life day to day, and in most of it, you know, we can take for granted, mm -hmm. but. You just never know when some minor decision that yeah. you make is going to have such an impact on or your life. Or if someone makes, like someone decides, lives in Fredo Way, Washington, they decide not to go to work today. And that cascades a series of events that affects someone else, right? That does right. something else, right? You know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, you, there's so many movies that are about going back in time and fixing this and fixing that, you know, and, and they're, you know, they're fun to watch. But, you know, when you, when you take that same concept and apply it to your own life, you know, you can think of maybe one very minor decision that you made that severely altered the outcome yeah. of your life. I mean, you went to a networking event, met someone you never met before. And then like six months later, they, like, Oh, Jason, or meet this person, you'll do this, you yep. know, like you just have no clue. Right. Yeah. It, it, so I mean, you have to put yourself out there. Yeah. You have to put yourself out there. And, you know, as as much as there's a possibility of something good happening, there's the same amount of possibility of something bad happening. And, you know, you, you just try to stay positive and look for the good stuff. Yeah. So in 1994, you decided to grow up again and get a job at Microsoft. So first talk about 
I'm course Microsoft wasn't really Microsoft like it is in back then, but it's like right. it's like a growing corporation, like it was like on the up. Like there had to be a culture shock, pretty much like pretty much working on your own, like do what you want to do. Yeah. To do what so what it was uh, 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 I say maybe not as bureaucratic as now, but uh, up and coming bureaucratic, very uh, Yeah, it, it, it was it was really interesting. And so um the reason why I got the job at Microsoft was my my wife is originally from Seattle and I'll, and that really didn't have a whole lot to do with why we moved to Seattle but um the company I was working for doing all that audio and satellite and ISDN work for in LA they were a publicly traded company and they got caught for insider trading and so their stock was going down the business was going down and uh, my wife was pregnant with our daughter at the time and I didn't I didn't know what the future held. Um, and so a cousin of my wife's worked at Microsoft and, and they were talking and uh, her cousin said, you know, there's a job here at Microsoft that Charlie might be good for. It's in video teleconferencing and they use ISDN technology. This is before the internet. And so my wife spoke to me about it and I'm like, not a chance. I do not want to move to Seattle. I, I love it here in LA. I love the weather. Um, you know, being able to ride my motorcycle in January through the Santa Monica mountains, you know, or up to Santa Barbara. I love doing all that. Um, but, you know, her and her cousin kind of pushed me in, into doing this interview. So I, I remember doing a phone interview and thinking, great, you know, I'll never hear from these people again. Well, I heard from them again, and it was a video teleconferencing interview from the Microsoft sales office in Santa Monica. And I remember going to that, and I one of the interviewers asking me a question, and uh, he really challenged my answer. And I thought, great, they'll never hire me. And then I get a phone call. <laughs> we want you to come up to Seattle to interview. And I think I did six interviews in one day, and, and I get hired. Um, and so they moved us up, and we ended up moving up here in my wife's ninth month of pregnancy. But I remember um, the biggest biggest part of it I remember was to me, it was like going to college, you know, the whole campus atmosphere, um, the way you did the work, the way you went to meetings, what you did in meetings. To me, it was like going to college again. So it was, it was really kind of interesting. And, um, you know, at that time in the mid nineties, if you had an idea of something you wanted to try at Microsoft, a new way of doing something, the answer was go for it, just do it. Let us know how it works out. Um, and then, you know, as my 20 years progressed, you know, um, that became less and less the case, which is understandable because as a company grows, you can't have everybody going off and just trying whatever they want. Um, but yeah, it definitely became more bureaucratic and um, less enjoyable as the years went on. Yes. So going back to 1978, with all the stuff you're doing, you know, the musician stuff, actor stuff, uh -huh. moving around, whatever, you started taking my photography too. Yeah. And then, like, I don't know if this is just a lucky break of your part or, or a decision point, but your first client was the, the rock band Queen. Yeah. How'd that come about? Um, somebody, I, I had been taking just band shots for free in all the clubs around Boston. At that time, the drinking age was 18. And even though I was 16 and 17, I would get in. And so I, I would meet a few people. And um, Queen wasn't the actual client. The actual client was a magazine. And I, I knew this guy um, who was, you know, photographing a lot of different bands. And he called me one afternoon at my parents' house and, uh, and just said, hey, you know, I'm supposed to be, didn't, at first he didn't say who it was. He said, um, I'm supposed to be photographing a band tonight. And something came up and I can't make it. And my editor said I had to find someone to replace me. So are you free tonight? to go into Boston and photograph a band. And I said, well, okay, let me ask my parents if I can use the car. And, you know, I said, fine, you know, how much does it pay? And I think it was like 50 bucks or something, which back then was, you know, it's like $150 or $200 now. And so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. You know, so where do I have to go? And he said, well, you know, the concert starts at eight, but you need to get there at seven. Um, and it's at Boston Garden. Boston Garden, who's, you know, okay, you know, what, what's going on at Boston Garden? Who's playing? He said, well, Queen is playing. And, you know, at that point, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody had already hit. This was a couple albums after, I think it was their jazz album or something. And uh, he said, so I, I, 
I need you to photograph Queen. And I'm like, okay. And my camera at the time was a Pentax K1000, which was the most basic camera you could ever find, totally manual. Um, there wasn't even autofocus in those days. And the lens I had, I got from an ad out of the back of a Rolling Stone magazine for $27. So it was this crappy lens, crappy camera. I'd photograph bands, but never in an arena environment. Um, and so it was like, well, you know, thrown into the fire. Let's give it a go. And so, um, yeah, I photographed the band. And um, I think I kind of pissed off the editor of the magazine because I didn't give him the film right away. I wanted it developed and I wanted to keep it. I remember shooting slides. And so um, I remember the next day him getting, you know, calling me and I'm like, well, no, I brought it to, you know, the department store to get developed. It's going to be a couple of days. It's like, well, I have to go to press and, you know, however much time I said, don't worry, you'll get your photos. And so I had two copies. I, I had the, the actual slides made from the film and I had them make duplicates, which were like a generation down. And I gave him the duplicates. I wanted to keep the, the real ones. And so, yeah, that's how I... That that was my first professional photography experience. Were you able to interact with the, anyone in the band no. itself? No, okay. No, no interaction whatsoever. Okay. Um, but interestingly, I ended up photographing Queen, I think, two more times. The last time I photographed them was at Madison Square Garden. Um, I think it was their tour for the game. And although, I mean, I didn't meet the band, but I remember Brian May, the guitarist, during his... Uh, solo i was standing up to take his photo and um not a lot of other people were standing up and he saw me standing up to take his photo and he came right to the front of the stage held his guitar up continued with the solo allowed me to take his photo nice. and when he saw me put my camera down then he kind of kept playing with his left hand hammering and waved to me with his right hand and i'm like that's the photo i would have loved to have yeah, had that and, right and, and he you know and he continued on with his guitar solo um so you know that's like you know a little bit of communication artistic communication if you will that i have with the band but you know i i also photographed them in providence rhode island and i think it was on that same tour um and then a few and then i think a few months maybe a month and a half later when they're at madison square garden I photographed them there as well. So you started Miss Around Photography in 78. You would actually start your business in 99. Yeah. So in those 21 years, like just a few questions, like, like, were you just spend that time like to hone your craft more? We were like, man, I'm not good enough to be a truck offer yet. Like what, why so long? That's 20 years. That's a pretty big gap. Yeah, it is. It is a huge gap. And it wasn't so much. I was thinking I want to hone my craft or anything like that. You know, I was, I was still taking photos. And even within that time, my apartment was broken into and my camera and lenses were stolen. And so I even went a couple of years without, without a camera. Um, but it was more, I was concentrating on my music and acting career. And, you know, I would take photos of band, friends, bands, or, you know, if there was, uh, if I was going to CBGB one night, I would just take my camera and take photos of bands and let them know. Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't really getting paid for it. Or, you know, I'd be walking around Manhattan and take photos or, you know, other friends of mine who are actors, I would take their headshots for them. Um, you know, it wasn't, it was one of those things where people said, oh, you're really good at it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, if you asked me to reproduce what I was doing, I probably couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, then it was, it was finally, I think, spring of 94, where I decided I'm going to learn this and I'm going to do it. And so that's when I started to take it seriously. So in 99, you're about to, you're doing the photography business. I'm for some reason, you do it full time, but then your son got diagnosed with something. It was another decision point where you decided, no, I can't, Think about Microsoft job yet. So you were doing your Microsoft job, photography, and then yeah. talk about the, going off with your son. Yeah. And so um, when I got hired at Microsoft in late 94, the original plan was I'm going to work five years. During that five years, I'm going to build my photography business. And in 1999, I'm going to leave Microsoft and launch my business. So everything was on track to do that. Um, you know, we, my daughter was born in late 94. She was growing up. Everything was going well. Um, and my son was born in 98, late 98, and something wasn't quite right uh, that eventually uh, led to a diagnosis of autism. And so that kind of put my plans on hold as far as going full time into photography. I still have my business, but Microsoft had amazing benefits and one of the most progressive autism benefits at the time. And so 
what was I going to do? You know, I, I decided, well, yeah, I mean, you really had no choice. Yeah. At, at that point, you know, no choice. And so I stayed at Microsoft. Um, and so during, you know, during those years, especially his younger years, his first six or seven years, um, you know, we had, um, we had access to all sorts of therapies that were completely paid for. And so, you know, my wife was, you know, almost five days a week, sometimes twice a week, driving him to different therapies to, you know, kind of help him get along. And um, I, I like to say they worked because he became a regular pain in the ass teenager. Um, but, you know, it, it was definitely worth it. And, um, you know, it, it, it made him what he is today, you know, so it was, uh, it was important that I stayed. Um, as much as I grew to um, despise my job uh, at Microsoft, um, you know, I, I knew that it was worth doing just to, you know, give him and my daughter as well. You know, I mean, you know, she needed medical things, you know, we all do. So it was in the best interest of everybody in the family to stay at Microsoft for a while. So I had to use the word dummies 101, but give us like a dummies 101 what actually is oxygen, but people like, they hear the word all the time. Yeah. Kind of what, what actually is it? You know, um, it's such a wide spectrum. People can be mildly affected. People can be um, quite significantly affected to where they can't function without a 24-hour aid. And I, I, I know there's a medical definition for it, but if I had to put my own definition for it, it is a way of perceiving your world, maybe even your own existence in a way that is not in tune with how the rest of the world perceives. So your wave rate, is that kind of off versus everyone it else? It can, yeah, I, I guess that's another way of putting it. You know, it, it's maybe, you, you could talk about it as a filter, um, you know, communication, you may, you're maybe, you know, in, in a very, um, impacted diagnosis communication is very difficult. You're, you're not able to communicate in a, in a quote, normal way. Um, typical, I guess is a better way of putting it. You're, you're no, you're not able to communicate in a typical way and you don't see things in a typical way. Um, when you meet someone with autism, who's severely affected, it doesn't mean they don't understand what you're saying doesn't mean they can't process what you're saying, but it may mean that they can't react to you in a typical way. They can't get words out. They can't process a way to communicate in a language, you know, a spoken language that we're all familiar with. Um, some of the people that you may think are so severely affected by autism, and they are, they can understand everything you're saying and doing and, and completely process it. But they they can't necessarily express it. Um, so th that's one extreme. The other extreme, you know, when, when I was going to school, late 60s, early 70s in elementary school, you know, they were the quote, weird kids, you know, the kids who didn't quite fit in. Um, they maybe saw things in a different way, perceived things in a different way. Um, you know, I, I know with my son, um, speech was delayed. And, you know, it, it, I, I can't even explain how lucky we are as a family that my son, you know, progressed the way he did. But, you know, for a long time, we thought he'd be living with us for the rest of our lives. And, and who knows, you know, what his situation would have been after that. Um, but, you know, at, as he developed speech, you know, just the way he would communicate with us seemed, you know, a little weird or a little off. You know, we'd go to a park and he might go up to a bunch of kids and say, hi, my name is Jackson, you know, J-A-C-K-S-O-N. That's my sister, Miranda. That's my dad. He works at Microsoft. He has no hair, you know? And so, you know, I mean, just the thought process of how you communicate and what, what you think is important information to you, you might try to relate to somebody else when to anybody else, it, it's not any information of a of importance, you know, I'm sure the kids were saying, yeah, fuck you, kid, just push me on the swing, you know, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, it, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that takes getting used to, but once, once you're used to 
you know, understanding what autism is, what it involves, then you can actually start to relate and communicate with people on the spectrum. So once you get autism, that you have it for life, is there any kind of cure or does medication take care of it or? People can progress. And, and obviously my son did. Um, I mean, is there a chance that someone like your son can regress and go back, so to speak? You know, I, I imagine there might be, you know, I mean, I, 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 I would I would think that would be more in a case where someone makes some progress, not total progress, but then falls back. As far as a cause goes, I mean, there, there's so many different ideas and thoughts of what may cause it. Um, I know one of the one of the theories has been vaccinations because there's mercury in vaccinations. Um, so that's why there was a huge spike in in diagnosis when in actuality, you know, the the um, the way it was diagnosed was was changed, and then you saw a spike. You know, as far as what was considered autism. Um, but you know, on the other hand, um, you know, people can get better. Maybe not a hundred percent better. Maybe they're able to live on their own. Maybe they're able to live in a group home, and function and and take on a job. Um, or you know, maybe yeah, they were the weird kid in school, but you know they. They got through college. They're very well educated. They can work at places like Amazon and Microsoft. You know, they still might be that person. Well, you know, they're a little strange, but they know what they're doing. And we can get along with them. Um, so again, it's it's a very wide spectrum. Um, you know, I know I know one of the potential causes we had heard about was uh, lack of oxygen at birth. And when my son was born, the cord was wrapped around his neck and he wasn't breathing. And uh, they had to what the nurses called jump start him. You know, I couldn't cut the cord. You know, they had to take him over to a special table, rub him, bang on his chest and get him going. Now, whether that had anything to do with it or not, I have no idea. And probably nobody does. Um, but as far as cause and cure, you know, nobody really knows. Does genetics have anything to do with it? It may or it may not. Okay. So and how old was your son when you got di diagnosed? Sorry? How old was your son when you got diagnosed? Um, so at that point, people were hesitant to uh, diagnose before three years old. Okay. We knew he had it, but um, back then, you know, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, doctors would not diagnose it before the third birthday. Okay, so they're three years old? Yeah, but we knew. We, it okay. was no surprise to us. So let's say someone comes to you and their son's three years old or daughter's three years old, yeah. and the doctor just gave him this diagnosis, mm -hmm. and they're coming to you for advice. What advice would you give, the, give these parents? Um. Well, number one, um, get them as much therapy as you possibly can from gross motor skills to social skills. Um, and I know that's not always easy because a lot of insurances don't pay for it. But, you know, really, really go with your gut. Um, parents, typically parents know what's best for their kids. And I would also say, don't be afraid to push them a little bit beyond their comfort level. You know, I, I think a lot of times when you have a kid and, um, you know, they may object to something or not want to do something, you know, as parents, sometimes you, do, you don't want to hurt your kid. And I'm not saying hurt your kid, but I can think of instances in our lives with, with our son where there were some areas where maybe we should have pushed him a little bit further and he might be a little bit better off for it today. Um, those happen to be in the areas of eating. Um, sensory integration disorder is, is a big part of autism. So, you know, you, a lot of times you see kids with autism with, you know, um, you know, big headphones on, which are really, you know, tampering down sound because they're very sensitive to sound. Um, you know, with my son, he had what they called um, sensory integration disorder with oral tactile defenses, which means he was very sensitive to textures in his mouth. And so, um, it's really the last vestige of the autism that he has, you know, and which was our first clue that was something was wrong, but, you know, he's very, um, very particular about what he will eat and won't eat because he's become accustomed to certain textures of food that he likes and doesn't like. And perhaps if, you know, we had pushed him maybe a little bit harder in a few areas, maybe it wouldn't be such an issue for him today. Okay. In 2008, you started your, your art stories, oxen, oxen, oxen project. Was this the book you wrote or this is something totally different? It ended up being a book, but it started out as a small project 
Um, I was living in Woodenville at the time. And um, I decided I was going to take some images of kids on the autism spectrum and have their parents write a story about what it was like to live with autism. And I told them, um, you know, I don't want it to be fake. I want it to be real. If you're angry, tell me you're angry. You know, if you're happy, tell me you're happy. It can be general or, or it can be about a very specific situation. <laughs> so I did about 10 of them. I hung them up in a Starbucks in Woodenville. Figured that was the end of it. And um, started getting a lot of phone calls about people who wanted to be part of it. So after a couple of years, it uh, ended up being over about 50 people. And I decided to turn it into a nonprofit organization and ended up getting about 250 photographers from around the country to go out in their communities and do the same thing. And uh, we had exhibits all around the country and, a, uh, and an online gallery. So we ended up with probably about 500 portraits and stories. Can you still see this online somewhere? I took the site down because when I originally did it, it was built on Flash. And around 2018, Flash was no longer supported. And I did not want to rebuild a 500 page website. So, um, is there any way you can build it back? Well, or, well, it has to be somewhere on store. So, what I, what I encouraged all the photographers to do was to put it up on their own websites. And on my website, under my about section, um, there's, uh, there's a page for stories of autism, and it has a number of the images and stories that I created on there. Okay. And, and you actually, and you wrote a book also, didn't you? I basically turned it into a book. Okay. So, you know, it was a publish on demand and um, it was basically, you know, it had a forward and it had a lot of the images and a lot of the, um, a lot of the stories in there as well. Okay. Um, so let's like go back to your son. So your son, his name's Jackson, right? Yeah. He's actually become a very accomplished jazz um, saxophonist, correct? Yeah. Can you talk he, about this, like, how proud that must be for you for him, like makes his progress, like being, I mean, he's pretty well known. Yeah, he's he's definitely well known in the Seattle area. He's only 24. Um, he just um, he just became interested in the saxophone and in jazz when he was in junior high. And um, he originally started playing the drums, um, but then there were so many drummers in the school band, he never got an opportunity to play as much as he wanted to. And then saxophonist dropped out and he said, asked the, well, actually he didn't even ask the band director. He showed up with a saxophone one day and said, I want to play saxophone. And the band director was, well, okay, kid, you know, give it a go. And um, he ended up really taking to it. Do you think your background in music influenced any kind of way to get involved in music? Um, it may have. Um, I mean, it was always listening to music around the house, um, all sorts of different artists and, and styles of music. So he always heard it. And um, so it, it may have had an influence on him. I mean, he says, you know, it definitely had a bit of an influence on him. But, you know, as far as actually going out there and playing, I was never a saxophone player. Um, you know, he just, he heard jazz one day and fell in love with it. I think he was in eighth grade and he just hasn't looked back. So you spent quite a few years in the business industry doing different things. Yeah. What kind of advice have you passed on to as far as like the actual business part of the company? Yeah, it, it was pretty much what I said earlier. I said time is the most important thing. Play on time and be on time. Um, you know, and so that, that's been that's been the basic level of, of advice. But really, you know, a lot of it comes down to the marketing of what he does. Um, he's a pretty humble guy. He's very well liked. Um, but you know, there have been times I said, you know, Hey, you know, you should try to do this and try to do that, you know, get out there a little bit more. Don't be afraid to talk about yourself. And he no longer is. Um, but you know, now it's more like, you know, if he's, um, you know, if he's trying to get a gig, say maybe, you know, in, in Denver or someplace like that, and he's, you know, trying to contact somebody, a lot of times he'll run, he'll run by, you know, what he's trying to say by me. Um, and there was a couple summers ago, he was putting together a tour, you know, and I said, okay, well, you know, um, have you arranged for this? Have you arranged for that? Do you have a contract with contingency? You know, what if you show up and, you know, the owner of the club says, hey, you know, something happened, we're not going to do the show tonight. Well, how are you going to be reimbursed for that? So a lot of it is more on the business side rather than on the artistic side. I mean, there's a reason there's a saying start with an artist, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, artists tend to, 
get into the business of art because they like the art, not necessarily because they like the business. Um, and I can say the same thing for a lot of photographers. Um, they get in because they like to take photos and then the reality of having a natural business hits them and they end up not succeeding. So with Jackson, is the plan with him, you might not, you might not answer this, does he plan to do like his own album down the line or what do you think? Yeah, like? and so um, funny, he's being pressured by the jazz community here in Seattle to do that. And so, um, uh, so a week, in another week and a half or so, he's actually uh, debuting a show with all original songs. So he's doing about 12 original songs. What was that going to be at? It's going to be at, um, uh, it's up on Capitol Hill. It begins with a V. Hold on. Okay. It's the name of that place. Um, uh, let me get it out here. It's on the 29th. So that's next Wednesday. And it is Vermilion. Okay. Vermilion. It's right next to Cafe Racer up on uh, Capitol Hill. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's got a great band put together. I think it's going to be four people, some of the best jazz musicians in the city. Um, yeah, and it's going to be, I think, almost all the songs are going to be his original songs. Okay, nice, nice. So, um, talking back to decision points. Yeah. In 2014, Microsoft pretty much said, Charlie, it's time for you to go be a photographer full time. Yeah, <laughs> It's it's really interesting. I was part. I was the third wave as part of a very large layoff that year, and um, I was actually, I, I was hired on Halloween of 1994, and I was laid off on Halloween of 2014. Twenty years to the day, and I had been planning to leave about a year later. Um, I was waiting for my wife. She was getting her nursing degree. And, you know, presumably she would get a job and be six months into a job, you know, be in a regular routine and I would leave. Um, and so I toyed with getting another tech job for a while, but the landscape and the way you get a job, it changed, you know, uh, back in 94, you handed them a resume. Um, in 2014, by then you had to have all the right keywords, the right key phrases. And, um, my severance pay was about a year's pay. And I said, forget it. You know, I'm just going to start it right now. And so that's when I started my uh, full-time photography business. And when you started photography, what kind of photographer were you, were you at the beginning? So I was doing a lot of portraits, um, families, seniors, things like that. Um, and so... It, that, that's how I started. But because of the work I had done um, with my Stories of Autism project, I started getting commercial jobs for companies that um, hired people with disabilities. Um, and so I started doing commercial work that way and then started getting more and more commercial work. And after a couple of years, I decided that I really wanted to concentrate more on commercial photography. So how do you all say your eclectic background, you know, musician, actor, other things you did? prepare to be an entrepreneur? Um, even though I was doing those things, it was kind of like being in business for myself. And then during my time at Microsoft, I ran a team of people um, that had a very specific skill set that nobody else had. And so that was like running my own business. And so, you know, um, the main thing is, is, is marketing. Without clients, you don't have a business. And so, you know, it's the same thing, you know, when I was auditioning, whether it was musically or for a theatrical production, you know, that's kind of like marketing. You have to be ready. You have to be ready to go out there. You have to be ready to get the clients. You have to have a great product. Um, and then you have to put it all together and, and devise a way of convincing people to do business with you. I have to guess, even though you're like, you started full time in 20, 2014, and I actually just decided one day to go to fuck off, right? I'm sure you were taking like get business from 99 to 14. Yeah. You gotta have like you you were like you was like it wasn't like you were unknown. Right. Yeah. And so I I, I was developing my business. Um, there were times I might take three hours off in the middle of the day at Microsoft and and you know, go do a photography job and and come back and, and finish the day. But yeah, I, I had clients, and so it wasn't like I was just starting cold. So, you know. 
I did have clients and I let them all know that I was now, you know, full-time into the photography and looking for new clients. And um, so I, I had a bit of a running start. Talk about this, Charlie. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially new ones, they're like, take all the money that comes in, right? Can you talk about your process for like, you know, like not hiring someone because it's not a good fit for you? Yeah. Um, it's really tempting to just say, hey, I'm going to find someone who can help me out with this or that. Um, and you bring them on and then you don't know what to do with them. Um, so it's really important that you are able to define your process, document your process, understand your process, um, understand the cost of that process, find ways that may seem like a cost, but by paying somebody else to do something, you're actually saving money. Um, so there, there are a lot of different things to consider, you know, before hiring somebody. Um, so just in the past month, I've actually brought on the first person in my business um, and they're working, you know, in sales and marketing and they are, you know, working on straight commission. Um, but it took me that long to really hone in what I was doing. I've had to make a few transitions um, in my business over the years. Um, but, you know, to get to where I am now, understand it and understand what I have to do and have all those processes written out that, you know, finally, after all these years, I've got someone working with me. So we talked earlier about, we talked earlier about, you know, how like, you know, like you might talk or just take photos, whatever. Can you talk about the points like, you know, knowing the numbers of your business, like financials, the unit metrics, all those kind of numbers, you know? Yeah. So you, you've, you know, um, You've got to understand, first of all, that your gross isn't your net. <laughs> <laughs> to a lot of people, you know, first start out and start out in business. So, you know, I need to know how much money I'm going to make on a job and what that costs. What's my time cost? What is it? What is my time cost to go out and set up if I'm doing something remotely? What does it cost for me to have um, a retoucher do some work as opposed to doing it myself? And so at the end of a job, although, you know, Somebody may be paying me five thousand dollars. How much am I really making on that job? And once you know, I figure out how much I'm making on that job. I have to know how much of that is going to go to my studio rent. How much of that is going to go to my website people? How much of that is going to go to my SEO people? Um, and then you know, every every month I meet with my SEO people to go over those metrics. How successful are we being? You know. Um, this month I paid you a thousand dollars, but you know, I only got five people who called me, you know, from finding me on Google. Why is that? You know, and so where do we need to trim trim investment in this area and beef up beef up investment in that area? So um you've you've got to be aware of your numbers. You've got to know where everything is going. Um, you've got to be able to set money aside for taxes. Um, so you know, those those huge numbers that may be coming in. Um, they may look nice, but, you know, when you get down to it, you've got to understand how much of that is, is really yours and how much is it going to sustain your business. And so I think another thing too, like a Microsoft, where you get the same pay every week, you know, whatever it could yeah. be. In your business now, you have some months that are better than others. Yeah. Probably having the discipline of like not benching the months are good, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, that comes with experience, you know? So um, I know typically when my good months are and when my slower months are. And it's just a matter of being able to say, all right, I am, you essentially need to put yourself on a salary. This is how much I'm going to make, you know, these two weeks or this month or this week and anything else gets put over here. Um, and then, you know, as you're putting all that money over there, you got to figure out, okay, well, this is how much I need to have on hand for the slower months. Um, this is how much I need to have on hand to upgrade equipment or invest in new equipment. Um, so yeah, it, it's, you know, it's real easy to get that big chunk and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, go to Vegas <laughs> or whatever. Um, but you know, you, you gotta have the discipline to understand, you know, where the money has to go. Charlie, how often do you upgrade your equipment or get new equipment? Every three or four years. I mean, it's, it's kind of on a cycle. It's mostly with camera bodies and, um, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not necessarily the tools. It's knowing how to use the tools. 
but sometimes tools come around, come along that make it easier. Um, and so that's how I will judge whether or not I need to upgrade something or not. So year to year, how much does camera tech actually like advance from year to year? Um, you know, break, I mean, real breakthrough stuff. You might get one company doing it once a year. Um, you know, as far as photography goes, that tends to be more incremental. So that from year to year, you might not notice a whole lot, but maybe three or four years, you're like, wow, that that's really a big difference. Maybe I should make that investment. So from, from your point of view, what makes someone like a really good photographer? Um, someone who understands light, which is the most important thing. That's what creates a photograph. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends on what it is they do. Um, but someone who understands their subjects, knows how to capture them, and knows how to capture the best of them. And that could be a landscape, it could be a person, it could be a building. Um, you know, it, it's just really being able to connect with whatever it is you're photographing it and capturing it at its best. So I know there's like different types of photography, right? I think there's black and white, different kinds. What's your favorite kind to do? Um, well, it was black and white. I think each has its advantage and disadvantage. I mean, what black and white does is that there's no distractions. You just get right to the subject. You're not distracted by a you know a, a bright orange here or maybe a bright red there or a deep blue at another part of it. Um, it, it really, really cuts to the heart of the matter. Um, and so I like that about black and white photography. Color, on the other hand, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a great visual experience with seeing those colors. Um, I've taken photographs that I've converted to black and white that work better as black and white. And other photographs I've tried to convert to black and white, and they need the color. Um, so, you know, it, it is kind of an apple and oranges type of thing. Um, I, I do like going back and I shoot in color simply because you get more information in a digital file with color and then convert to black and white. The capability is there for me to photograph just purely in black and white, but I like to have as much infor information as I can up front to work with. Charlie, are more people naturally more photogenic than other people? No. So that's, I, so that's a myth you hear sometimes? Yeah. Uh, just about everybody who comes into my studio says, I'm not photogenic. Good luck getting a photo of me. <laughs> and we usually end up getting a great photo of them. And, and really what it is, is capturing them when they're relaxed and engaged. On the other hand, I've had people come in who know they're good looking and think, well, this will be a piece of cake. And I take a photo of them and, you know, I want to run and hide. <laughs> I'm afraid it's going to jump off the, <laughs> jump off the computer screen and attack me. Um, so no, being photogenic to me is, you know, being able to capture someone as their authentic selves. Cool. Uh, so next, uh, 2019, you were diagnosed with something called Meniere's disease? Meniere's disease. Like, what is yeah. that? I have no clue what that is. So um, it's another one of those things where there's no really known cause and no real known cure. Essentially, what happens is your inner ear fills with fluid. And it can cause tinnitus hearing loss, and vertigo. Um, and you don't know when it's going to hit, and you don't know when it's not. So this is going to be an ignorant question. What, you can't just go in and get the fluid drained out or like, no? No, there is a process when it gets really bad. And by really bad, meaning that I can't stand up and, you know, I'm very nauseous and vomiting, um, where I can get a cortisone shot directly into my inner ear and it'll allow the fluid to drain. And I will go through a series of two or three of those over Do a week. Do you know when this is coming on? Sometimes. Okay. Generally speaking, I, I can figure out when it's gonna come along. But as far as um, you know, using something that will definitely prevent it from happening, no, there's, there's really nothing. Um, it can be different things from for different people. I mean, I, I know this one guy and uh, with him, it was, he 
he stopped drinking caffeine and he never had the problem again. Um, some doctors will prescribe a diuretic um, to get fluid out of your body, but that didn't work for me. Um, so it, it's real hit and miss. And it can go into complete remission. It can just get worse as life goes on with me. It's, um, I haven't had a really bad episode in a couple of years. I've had some times where I'm feeling all of a sudden feeling a little dizzy and my hearing, I only have it in one ear. Um, but you know, maybe my hearing is down by 30% and, you know, it might be a series of eight weeks where, you know, my hearing could be anywhere from totally gone down to, you know, 50% gone. Um, and then I'll be fine for a few months. So I just really never know when it's going to hit. So, so back to your son, autism real fast, and you might not know this. You have to know what percentage of people have autism. No. Okay. So, so back to you, what you have right now. When you get diagnosed with this, it made you make some some pretty significant changes to how you run your photography business, right? Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, so I was doing mostly commercial photography, and I, I was doing some headshots, but I was doing mostly commercial photography, and um, there were some big budgets involved, and a couple of years ago, I went back to Boston for five days, and every day I was back there, I had a horrific vertigo attack, and I just thought to myself, I can't take this chance with my business. Um, you know, if someone's paid me five thousand dollars in advance, and I've taken most of that to, you know, rent equipment and get this and that ready, and then you know, this organization or company has done whatever to get people ready, and then the day before comes and I can't travel, what am I going to do? Um, and so I, I tried to find an area that I thought that if I did have a bad vertigo attack would be least impacted. And so I decided to um, make headshots the main part of my business. Now, if you headshots, you only do them in Seattle or, or if they, of course, they, if they pay you enough, you travel to different places. Um, yeah, most of everything I do is in the Puget Sound area. Um, I haven't been asked to go anywhere else. I would probably be hesitant to do it just out of self-protection. You know, um, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to show up and not be able to do the job. Okay. Well, one thing, I think you do a great job using social media, especially LinkedIn to advertise your services. Yeah. Like, talk about how you got the, the process of deciding to use LinkedIn, you know, social media and all those kind of things. Well, you know, it, it came with identifying my audience, which I realized was business people or businesses. And LinkedIn is really, to me, the place where, you know, more business people uh, hang out and communicate than say like Facebook or anything else. So who, from your point of view, who's your perfect customer? My perfect customer, I have two. Um, as far as an individual goes, it is a person who understands that um, their headshot can impact their business and it impacts how people perceive them. And um, they need images that show them as they are now and images that will hit their target market. Um, hold on, sorry. Okay. Can we take a break? Yeah, we're gonna take a break. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Sorry. Don't worry. My parking expired right. and I don't want to get towed. Okay. Also, is there a chance I could use the mic? Yeah. Yeah. But we're gonna take a break real fast.
So we're going to start again as soon as the target gets back. Okay. All right. So, Lewis, for intermission. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just didn't want my car to get towed. No worries. So, Charlie, next, if you already talked about a sum, but, but you can go like more detail, like why you decided to start your business, what you focus on now, what you see the vision for your business too, and also whatever anything you want to go to your website, we can go through too. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> Um, you know, as far as my business goes. So yeah, now I'm primarily headshots. Um, I really like doing them. I like learning about what people do um, and learning how what I do can help them become more successful. I, I think that's the most rewarding part. I'm presuming you have a, I know you're pretty good, but you, you had a lot of repeat business, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so, and that's what I'm really working on. Um, and so with individuals, I mean, we're talking repeat business, like typically every couple of years. And so what I'm really focusing on this year, 2022 was the beginning of when I decided to really concentrate on headshots. I got a studio here in Seattle, um, you know, and I've established a, a pretty good customer base. 
Um, but now what I'm doing is I'm really focusing on businesses and organizations. Um, Does the industry matter? The no, not, not really. The industry really doesn't matter. Um, real estate is probably the toughest because they really don't give a rat's ass what they look like. <laughs> you, you think I would, you would think they would, you would think they would, but at the same time too, you know, they don't want to spend any more than 65 or $75. Um, and that's not, that's not my price range. Um, so what I'm working with now are um, a lot of businesses where I go, I'm able to bring my studio into their place of business, create images of, you know, all the people they need, they need images of, um, and they're consistent. They look like a team on their website. Um, yeah, I remember you, you, did, uh, you remember this time you did, you did like a little article on LinkedIn one time and you gave an example of how some photo shoots are so just horrible. Like, like they look like they're in prison or. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Yeah. I say it looks like a police line. Yeah. That's what, that's what it's. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because what you'll get. And um, as a matter of fact, just today, I was writing for my next newsletter that's going out. You know, it's so easy to have a great website now. It doesn't have to be a WordPress site. You know, there's GoDaddy and everybody else, you know, have these plug and drop, drag and drop sites that look beautiful. Um, but I'm a firm believer in you're only as good as your weakest link. And many times that's when you go to a, a, a web page and you go to the team or about page and you see the photos and they're usually a bunch of candids typically there's one or two vacation photos where maybe somebody's in a canoe with their dog. Um, you know, and what do you, what are you really trying to say to your, to your target market? You know, I mean, I think what you want to say is that I'm a professional. I take care of details. Um, you know, I'm going to make sure that the way I present myself to you is in a professional manner created by a professional. Um, and this is what you can expect from me. You know, we, we live, you know, I like to say now in a swipe left, swipe right society, you know, it's, we make so many judgments by the, by the first thing we see. And, um, you know, and a lot of times that's, that's a headshot. It's a, it's a profile photo on yeah. LinkedIn or wherever. I heard someone say, you know, they say not to judge a book by the cover. Right. But then why do books have covers? Exactly. Right. And, you know, I've known people who are just so great at what they do, you know, and then you look at their profile photo and, you know, it, it looks like Picasso on a bad day. <laughs> or they took it back in 2013 or something or. That's that's the other thing. Or, you know, I might might encounter a website where they do all have professional headshots, but they're taken at different times, different photographers, different camera height, different lighting style. So, you know, they. Or maybe 2015, they had a boob beard. Now they don't. Or maybe they lost the game, 20, 30 pounds. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing I tell people is you should really um, have your headshot redone every couple of years. Um, more, more often, if you've, you know, changed something drastically in your physical appearance. So like you said, getting rid of a beard, um, gaining or losing a certain amount of weight, um, you know, going from long hair to shaving your head. Um, when you show up looking differently than what people expect, it actually puts them on the defensive. Yeah. Like, you know, it, who are you really? Who, yeah. Are you really being authentic? Like, are you putting on a fake persona? Right. And it, I mean, and it goes back to that fight or flight, you know, that's been programmed into us since we were, you know, multiple cell beings, you know, um, you're programmed to try to sense something that's out of sorts. And then once you do sense that, you question it. And, you know, when you're doing business and you're dealing with people and um, you want to get their business, you need to remove those barriers. And part of that, um, whether, you know, it's good or bad, it, it's just a fact. Part of that is how you present yourself physically. And I'm not saying, you know, you have to be good looking. I'm not saying you have to be, you know, Overweight, underweight, you got to be accurate, you know, and that's what people want to see. A headshot is like from your neck up, right? Yeah, you know, I I kind of like say, you know, the third rib down up. Okay. Um, I mean, technically, that's it. You you go to a lot of, um, you know, 
photography sites and they say they do headshots and, you know, some of them will be three quarter shots, you know, and you, there's no light in the eyes, you know, I mean, the way I look at it is people look at the eyes, you know, that that's the first place people look. Um, they want to see the eyes. Those are for confidence. Your mouth is for approachability. And those are two of the most important factors. And if I'm looking at someone and it's a three quarter shot of them, you know, I, I really, I really don't get that sense of whether or not, you know, I can trust them or if I feel like they're really professional. Um, but to me, yeah, that headshot is like, you know, three ribs down and that's about it. Anything more? Well, I tell people it costs more money to take, you know, a yeah. photo of more of their body. Yeah. So in the past, have you had to tell people things like, you know, like you maybe not want to wear, you know, um, tequila bottle earrings, or maybe, maybe you want to rethink wearing a polka dot tie that spins in the middle. Or right. Maybe we want to think like wearing a corduroy jacket that's obviously from 1977. Right. Yeah. And so, and how, um, and how do you approach that? So I always try to head that off, head that off at the past. Now, ultimately it is the subject's decision. But before anybody comes in for a headshot, I send them information, uh, a PDF about, you know, what's good to wear, what you shouldn't wear, you know, and I, and I will say, you know, um, you know, earth tones or solid colors are the best, you know, don't wear anything that's too bright, too loud. Um, don't wear the big dangly earrings or the huge necklaces. Um, you know, I, I tell them you need to be industry appropriate. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a finance person, you don't want to show up looking like a dog walker. And if you're yeah. a dog walker, you don't want to show up looking like a finance yeah. person. I have to imagine a, a, how you do, how you do headshots for cannabis from be way different from if a cannabis company came in and did headshots. Yeah. I mean, well, it could be, it depends on their roles. I mean, you know, if they're, if they're a CEO and they're looking for funding, you know, I that's want good, them. That's I, good point. Yeah. I want I them. I think about people that's working the the canvas store, like you know, regular workers. Yeah, exactly. And you know, there are um, there are some companies I do work for where, um, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I I worked with a uh, a woodworking company. They build, um, you know, they build staircases. They build um, uh, fireplace mantles for new homes. And so they wanted me to photograph their, their team, you know, and these are all guys, they don't want to be in front of a camera, <laughs> you know, but you know, the, the thing is, you know, I don't want them in suits and ties. No. Absolutely not. You know, I want them to, I want them to look nice, you know, whatever. And by nice, I mean, you know, I want their clothes clean and wrinkle free, <laughs> you know, with no tears or rips. Um, and, you know, that can be a real challenge, you know, especially people who do not want to be in front of a camera. But, you know, before I see a client, before I go to a company, um, you know, I send them information with tips about hair, clothing, makeup, um, you know, anything that's going to distract from the face you don't want. You know, the, the, um, your attention immediately goes to the brightest area of an image that's followed by an area of great contrast and then followed by something that breaks a pattern. So, for instance, um, you know, you looking at a photo of someone, you know, the head's got a certain shape and all of a sudden there are these huge earrings. Well, your eye is going to go to those earrings. It's going to take the attention away from the face. Um, you mentioned stripes and patterns that can do it. Um, you know, a spinning tie or whatever. The only exception, and I put this in everything is unless it's part of your brand, avoid those things. I mean, you know, if you're a circus clown, then I expect you to have a spinning tie. Yeah. You know, yeah. most people will expect you to have, you know, yeah. a wild outfit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that goes into, you know, being true to your brand and, you know, being industry appropriate. Can a, can a photograph make someone look trustworthy when they're not and vice versa? Yeah, easily. Yep. Um, you know, we look at photographs through filters. You know, there might be... Um, Someone, you know, th there might be someone who is inherently dishonest and in well known for being in trouble with the law. And um, I could take a photo of them and they could look like the most decent, honest, hardworking person you could ever meet. Now, that's provided you didn't, you know, have a preconceived, you know, opinion of them. Um, but yes, you can definitely make people look a lot different than what they are. I know you do a lot of retouching, though. 
sometimes. How does retouching work and what's the purpose of it? Yeah, so my philosophy on retouching is um, leave no trace. I don't want people to look at a retouching job and say, oh, look, you know, you can tell that that got retouched or that got changed. Um, my philosophy is I want you to look like the best version of yourself as you are now. So what does that mean? That means I'm not going to totally get rid of every imperfection on your face. Otherwise, you're going to look like a Barbie or Ken doll, right? That we don't want. Like you're not doing an Instagram filter for anymore. No, no. So for instance, um, you know, if if someone smiles in a photo, then naturally, you know, we get a little extra under here. I typically reduce that by about 50%. It's still there. It still looks natural, but, you know, it still looks like the same person. Um, they're not going to show up and you're going to say, oh, you know, that looks like them 20 years ago, or, you know, ask them where their son or daughter is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's really leave no trace. Um, make people look like the best version of themselves as they are now. Um, occasionally, I do get a client who will say, oh, geez, you know, I thought I'd look a lot younger. Um, you know, I mean, if, if, if that's what they want, then fine. You know, I, I explain to them what it is I'm trying to do and how I want them to appear based on what they told me they wanted out of their photographs. And I will say, well, you know, I would recommend against doing this, but if you want me to, I, I will. I can't imagine like if I do business with someone and, the, and, the, and, the, and you think they're like 60 years old. I mean, you think they're like 30 because they're 50 and they're sort of like someone like a cane, you're walking with a cane, right? Like, yeah. Like, who am I doing business with? Like, exactly. Is that your daughter in the picture? Is this you? Like, yep. Yeah, it, exactly. And, you know, that's the whole thing. You know, I mean, when you're marketing, you're trying to build trust mm -hmm. um, and authenticity and confidence and you want to be approachable. And, you know, anything you do that, you know, is counter to how you're going to show up is is going to put those perceptions and that relationship in jeopardy. So Charlie, if someone wants to get a head photo, headshot from you, how far back do they go? Typically a couple of weeks. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean so, it varies. Oh, I, so actually, I thought it would be like a longer week than that since you're like pretty like well known and stuff. Well, it's um, a lot of times people only call a couple of weeks in advance, you know, and sometimes I get people calling say, hey, I, you know, can we do it tomorrow? And can I have the pictures in, in three days? Yeah, I'm sure you have like a, a rough job package, right? Yeah. You know, um, I really don't charge for a rush job. Okay. Simply because I work with a couple different retouchers. Um, there are some that work a little more quickly than others. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, you know, in my pricing, I can, I can afford to, to okay. do that rush job. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's another question for you. I, I think a lot of startup entrepreneurs and business people in general have a big challenge that knowing what to charge, right? Yeah. And like, you know, they always like charge. I think the saying is like, we're somewhere like, what are you charging? Probably charge at least two or three times more. Mm -hmm. What was your process of finally figuring out the, the, your perfect pricing policy? It was really, um, it, 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 it was an evolution. And I really only, well, you know, and it'll continue to be an evolution. Um, a lot of it is understanding your market, understanding your value, understanding how you work with people. And a lot of it too comes from the feedback you get from people. You know, if I were to get feedback from someone and I ask for very honest feedback and they say, well, you know, you didn't capture this, you didn't capture that. I wish this was different. Yeah, this was good. But I mean, if I had that kind of reaction, then I probably, you know, would say, all right, I've got work to do. And because I've got work to do, I shouldn't be charging X amount of money. It's more like I should be charging this. Um, a lot of it is looking at other people in the market. So looking at, you know, whether it's headshots or whatever, you know, what are other people charging and what does their work look like? Um, and so it's that. And then, you know, it's getting to a point where you feel you've honed your craft to um, a point where it's reproducible. You have no problem doing it. Um, and then saying, okay, well, now I calculate all my pricing, like we, like we spoke about before, how much am I paying in rent? How much am I paying my SEO people? How much am I paying my retouchers? Um, and then figuring out, you know, okay, well then what do I need on top of that? And then hopefully you come up with a figure that allows for all of that, that, you know, you're not undercutting yourself or, you know, gouging your clients. So you've been doing photography for a while now. Having said that, do you have any mentors? 
in photography business or in business in general, just photography and images in general? Yeah, I would say when I decided that I would need to go to um, doing headshots, and actually it was even a little bit before that, um, I'd had my eye on a guy named Peter Hurley, who's based out of New York, and he's considered um, the best headshot photographer in the world. And um, I remember buying his book and saw a few videos, you know, that that he had done on YouTube. And then when the pandemic hit, um, I thought, well, you know, I, I lost pretty much six months worth of work within a week. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe this is a good time to, you know, reconsider how I do business and what I do for business. And it was right after I get um, diagnosed with Meniere's disease. And um, so I thought, well, you know what, he has this thing called the headshot crew where he teaches people his methods and how he works with people. And I thought I would just join that and give it a go. And not only did it transform the way I create an image, not only headshots, but other images, but it also transformed the way I think about business and the way I do business. Um, and so he is right now top of my list for mentors. And on top of that, I mean, he's just a really great guy, you know, I don't know if eccentric is the right word to use, but he's definitely got his own personality. He's very out there. He's also a world-class sailor. I believe he was on the Olympic team that went to um, Australia uh, back, I think, in 2000, back to Sydney. And he still competes internationally and finishes in the top three in, in his class. So he's a very talented guy, very funny guy. Um, he's also very straightforward. You know, if you show him a photo and he looks at it and, it and he mentors to your ability. But, you know, I've had him say to some of my photos, wow, you know, that looks like shit. What were you thinking? You know, <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, OK, you know, there's a little bit of a bruise to the ego. But, you know, he's he doesn't necessarily mean necessarily say it in a mean way. But, you know, he's just really been a huge influence. And I guess back in November, I sent him an email um, about so he he was helping me out with one aspect and I sent him an email and I actually told him you know how much I I thought of him and how over the past few years his business you know and what he had taught really influenced me and and then I remember one Saturday morning I I just got a phone call from him and you know we were talking about business and where I need to go um, so you know he's not only is he a great mentor towards me he's just a a great guy on top of it. So Charlie, second part of the question. Yeah. Who are you mentoring? Ah, well, um, every once in a while, I wouldn't say right now I'm not necessarily actively mentoring someone on a consistent basis, but um, I will have people get in touch with me who are just starting out in their careers and um, they will ask me, you know, well, you know, I'm thinking of going to college and, and learning this, you know, should I major in photography? I always tell them, no, you should major in business. And, uh, you know, keep up the photography. There are places to learn it. But yeah, occasionally I will get some people who uh, want to learn more. And so I will take them out. And um, on some of my gigs, they can assist. And we will go over lighting. Uh, we will go over, you know, how to create a different type of shot, how to relate with people, which I think is 90% of it. Um, there have been some great photographers who are just, quite frankly, complete assholes. And nobody wants to work with them. So I think, you know, being able to develop people skills is incredibly important, especially I know I do a lot of um, expression coaching. So, you know, I'm trying to get different expressions, different looks out of people, and they have to trust you. Um, and so I will um, talk to people about that and just generally, you know, how to how to work in the industry and, um, you know, to understand that, you know, it's not all about the equipment. Um, you know, it's really about finding your voice and what you do and being able to create, you know, using that voice. So Charlie, hypothetical situation. Yeah. So you, so that's what you, you're not hiring, you know, you're, you're doing stuff your own, but there's a photog part of photographer out there, you're kind of brand new, like an experience. And they know, man, if I come out work for Charlie, any kind of way, I'll, I'll just advance my growth much faster. What would this person have to do to convince you to bring to bring them on? An in internship, a principal role, payroll, whatever role might be. What would this person have to do to convince you? Like this guy, this person is is worth my time to bring him on. Yeah. Um, more than the talent that they may or may not have, and I've kind of followed this 
whether I was a Microsoft manager or directing a show or anything like that, it's their willingness to absorb information and to put out an honest effort. Um, if someone is open to learning and open to giving 100%, you can teach them anything and they will learn anything. So that to me, I, I would rather have someone who knows nothing about photography with a great attitude towards learning it than having someone who is just has amazing potential, does great work, but doesn't want to listen to a thing I say. Um, and, and not meaning that, you know, what I say is gospel or anything like that, but, you know, they have to be open to, um, to feedback. Um, they can disagree with it, which is fine. We can have conversations. That's perfectly fine. But, you know, if someone just shows up and they think they know how to do everything and uh, they're not going to listen to anything I say and they're not going to show up on time um, and they're not going to act appropriately with a client, then I want nothing to do with them. Charlie, is there like a dream or bucket list headshot out there? Something you want to do? Some are famous or maybe not famous. It's like, you know, like this is like your dream shot. I always wanted to photograph David Bowie, which obviously now is is not a uh, not a possibility. But you know, it would probably be um, a musician that I really respect. Um, love to photograph Peter Gabriel. Um, like I said, David Bowie was someone I always wanted to photograph. Um, probably someone in the arts, some kind of artist. Um, they are probably more open to different ideas, different approaches. And, you know, that's one thing with headshot photography. It is pretty much formulaic. Um, but, you know, I do take the opportunities to photograph people in different situations. And um, people who are artists, singers, musicians, um, they always seem to be a little bit more open to discovering new interpretations of who they are. Charlie, say anything else that you want to talk about or anything I did not ask you that you want to talk about? Um, no, I mean, really nothing other than, you know, the basic, how do you contact me? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, um, if you're interested in contacting me for a headshot um, or maybe even some personal branding or music photography, it's very simple. My website is ccheadshots.com. And there you can find a lot of information about the different things that I do. Um I like to work with nonprofits. I really believe in giving back and helping out uh, other people who need a hand. You do a lot of work with the, what's called a Shelley's one, a rede redefining. Yeah, redefining your future. Okay. Yeah. And so they do anywhere between two or four different events each year where they create, where they have symposiums for people who are transitioning from military to civilian careers. And they, you know, they want a LinkedIn shot. And so I will go down to, you know, whatever whatever they're doing and create images for anywhere between seven and 30 people and do all the retouching on them and give them images to, uh, to use in their, you know, quest for a new career. And then also every year they create a calendar for, um, for a fundraising project. And I typically do all the photos for those as well. So Charlie, um, any last minute wisdom or advice or any subject you want to talk about? Uh, you know, um, you know, if you're looking looking to me for that wisdom, you may be looking in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the best person everyone, everyone has ever given on this podcast. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. I know my limits and limitations. <laughs> so, Charlie, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, Jason. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.